Perfect. So we'll start with, um, by the way, I read your book. I just oh, cool. <laughs> and um, I, I think the third chapter will be, uh, obviously be the one that's yeah. most relevant to uh, to the video. And um, I really, all right, it, it's not going to be like, it might sound like a criticism, but it, it but it's not. It sounds, it, it's. And criticism's it's, okay. <laughs> it's, you know, it's written by a lawyer, not because it's like technical or whatever, because you're like, I feel like you're so good at showing both sides of mm. an issue mm. to a point where I feel convinced by both sides, mm. even though I am per, I'm a person with very strong opinions. Right. <laughs> and, you know, on, on, on drug addiction, on, well, non-drug addiction, on, on drug legalization, on, on guns, especially, especially the one on guns. I thought that mm. was a really, really uh, interesting way of like a uh, really compelling way of going about it. And it, it does feel <laughs> like it's a lawyer that writes it just because you're really good at rhetoric. Mm. And I feel like that's your job. But mm. one, another criticism I had, well, not that I had, but I was thinking about when, when reading and I was thinking about when people might watch the video is it's really easy to be critical of uh, marginalized groups, people of yeah. color, uh, women. And um, when you talk about police brutality or, you know, or the racism in, co in, in police institutions, um, targeting people of color, some people might say, that's not really the right way of going about it. You know, there's white mm. cops. Why are you criticizing black cops? Mm. Again, you know, it's so easy to criticize marginalized people. So um, did you think about that while writing the book? Did you, like, how did you handle it? Yeah, that's such a good, such a good question. I mean, I thought about it really honestly every day that I was writing the book. So, you know, I came to the project out of, in a way, the literature and the understanding that you're describing. You know, I, I had become a public defender in the 1990s because I viewed it as the civil rights work of my generation. I became a public defender because I thought that a mostly white American society was had created a set of laws and institutions that was very oppressive and harming many people, but especially uh, a disempowered black minority that had suffered from hundreds of years of disenfranchisement. And my parents had met in the civil rights movement. My dad is black, my mom is white, and they were in a group called SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and their, like, their generation had done so much to change America, but still, as I was graduating graduating law school in the 90s, I was seeing the in unfairness and injustice of the criminal justice or criminal legal system. And to me, it looked a lot like the segregation and other oppression that they had been fighting. So that, you know, that kind of understanding that you're describing um, is very much my own understanding. And then I go into a world like Washington, D.C., where so many of the decision makers are black, where I'm in front of black judges who are deciding what, what to do with my clients who are also black, but my clients have been arrested by black police officers. The laws were passed by a black majority city council. The mayor was black. The chief prosecutor was black. And the city was doing so many of the same things that the rest of the country was doing. So to me, the question then became, how did this come to be, right? How did it come to be that even in a majority black jurisdiction with some control of its local courts and its local criminal policy, we were making so many of the same choices that I believed then and still believe are, are racist and oppressive, right? And so I was writing this book not tr try to say that other story, right? The story of white supremacy is not important. Don't, don't pay attention to that. Only thing that matters is black decision makers. No, when you write a book, you're writing a book that's part of a conversation, right? So I always tell people, before you read my book, read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, read Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, read Between the World and Me by ta Coates, then read my book. 
because though I because those books were all written before my book, I had read those books, they had influenced me. So I view myself as part of a conversation with books like that. And I just mentioned three, but I could, you know, mention 10 or 15 more. And so I don't view myself as telling like the only story, right? And so therefore, I feel like it's then more appropriate to focus on these black decision makers because there is an assumption, at least for me, that the reader understands some of this larger conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. Because I, as I was reading, I was like, people... I mean, at the same time, people who will read this book will be sensitive to these issues anyway. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting because you go into a lot of nuance in each issues. You talk about uh, drug uh, drug legalization or criminalization. You talk about um, gun issues. And especially on those two, what, 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 what really hit me is that because very often when we talk about the black community, we talk about a monolith mm. and you add so much nuance and show show how there's there's there are um, differences in opinions. Like there are people who are more, let's say conservative, you know, there are people who are more liberal and, and there are like these, 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 these clashes of opinions within uh, the black community. And, you know, as there will be uh, conservatives, as there will be liberals, there will also be cops. <laughs> and uh, I was, I would like to talk about, uh, especially for the, for the subject of this video um, mm. about uh, the police. Mm. Uh, and um, I was surprised, as um, as some people might be as well, if they don't know as much uh, history, for example, um, about uh, about the, the civil rights movement, that a lot of civil rights leaders wanted black cops. They wanted black people mm -hmm. in the police force. Um, Can you talk, like, in a, like briefly about uh, the police uh, history uh, or black people's history in, in the police force? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll definitely try to be brief. It's, you know, at least a hundred years of history, maybe, you know, in two or three minutes. But, you know, the original story, you know, in Reconstruction and after Reconstruction. So in the United States, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, at a time of over racial oppression, the idea that a black person, right, who is recently out of slavery, would be empowered with a badge and a gun was unimaginable in large parts of the country, right? So black people were kept out of police forces. Black people were disenfranchised. They weren't even allowed to have guns, let alone have guns with the authority of the state. And then as part of the early civil rights movement, so 1930s, 1940s, right? We think of the civil rights movement as the 1960s, but of course people are fighting for civil rights throughout this these decades. Part of the argument for racial justice was an argument to have black police officers. So the in my book, I really focus on Atlanta, which is actually where I'm from, and one of the parts of the U.S. that has, you know, long had a substantial black population and a black middle class and black leadership. And in Atlanta, the call was and they would march for this with 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 signs that said 100,000 Negroes deserve one Negro police. And Martin Luther King Sr., the father of the great civil rights leader Martin Luther King, he was what he spoke in favor of uh, the civil rights demand of having one black officer. We need to have a black officer in this community. That was that was the claim that they were making. One of the things that people tend to not understand, but it's really important, is that from the beginning, there have been differences of opinion about what difference Black officers would make. So some people wanted Black officers because they actually thought that they would be more vigorous in uh, addressing crime in Black communities. It's hard to think about now, but you know, 100 years ago, one of the claims was that crime in black communities was ignored by the white power structure because they didn't care what went on in those black communities. Other people thought that black officers would be less brutal towards black suspects, right? Black that's that's kind of what we think of today maybe as as the most common rationale. Other people thought 
and there was a class element to this, but there were members of the black middle class in Atlanta in particular that wanted black police officers because they thought that black officers would be able to distinguish between elements of the black community. For white officers, all black people look the same, but a black officer would be able to tell the difference between a pastor or a teacher or a doctor who deserve respect and maybe somebody who is out there breaking the law. And then the final argument for black officers was just that these are jobs and people need a chance to have a good job, right? Whether they'll make a difference in the job or not, it's a job and people should have a chance to have that job in the same way that they deserve a chance to have a job as a, a steel worker or a, or a firefighter, right? We don't demand that black people, we don't say, well, you have to be better at fighting fires, that that's a rationale for having the right to have that job. It's just the right to have a job that everyone else could have. So what I would say now, as we sit here, you know, 100 years after those first struggles, is we are really living with the legacy of never being clear or never being unanimous about what difference black officers were supposed to make. So then people are always surprised when we see stories and it looks like the black officers didn't make any difference. They did the same thing that a white officer might have done in that situation. And people say, well, how could that be? Absolutely. And and it leads us to uh, the 1980s when Basquiat makes a painting denouncing the irony of black policemen. Um and I, I try to explain a bit what, what's the irony behind it for like, you know, because it might, it might seem uh, obvious, but what is the irony of uh, to a, a New Yorker artist who's kind of a vagabond and who, who writes, who, who, you know, what's the irony of a black policeman? I mean, different people are going to have, you know, different ironies. And um, I don't think you know, for myself, I could never say like exactly what is the irony that a particular artist had in mind at a particular moment. But I can say that a common irony that people would have felt at that time was that by the 1980s in New York, that one black officer that I talked about Martin Luther King asking for in the 1940s had now grown to a point where there were significant numbers of black officers, especially in big cities throughout the US. So in some cities like Atlanta and DC, black officers would actually be become a majority of the police force by, the, by later in the 1980s. In other cities like Memphis and Detroit, it would take a little bit longer, but they would also become majorities. And in a city like New York, black officers were never a majority, but they were a sig significant number. And you also had black people, not just as rank and file officers, but in leadership positions. So you have a black police chief in New York by the late 1980s. And the irony is, or one irony is, that even with the increase in those numbers in that representation, the police are still behaving the same way. The police in the 1980s in New York are beginning to adopt a more kind of aggressive approach. Some of the early things that later then would become known as the stop and frisk regime um, start to take effect. Um, and so one irony from the standpoint of a black citizen, right, especially somebody who's maybe living a little bit at the margins that is more likely to be subject to heavy police surveillance, is the idea that I now have a black face, but I'm still being mistreated. Um, and there's another irony, I think, that is from within the policeman himself. Because mostly so far we've been talking about what it feels like for a citizen or what it feels like for a community. But one of the other stories that's really important here is how hard it is for Black police, particularly in districts where, like New York, where they're not a majority. Because what happens, especially in those early days, in the late 60s, 70s, early 80s, when we start to see Black police officers arrive, is they come into these jobs, but they're surrounded by a racist structure. They're surrounded by white superiors that don't want them there. They're surrounded by a set of tactics that demand that they go out uh, and really 
um, mistreat in a lot of ways black citizens. And some of them are okay with that, but some of them are not. And some of them are resentful. And some of them just want to keep their job. So they end up doing things that, in a way, I don't want, you know, torture themselves. Like they end up doing things that they don't, aren't happy about doing, but they do them. And one thing we know about human nature is you put somebody in a situation where they don't want to do something, the first time it creates anxiety, the second time it's a little less, and after a little while, they're just doing it. And they've forgotten that they ever originally thought it was a bad thing to do. Um, so for me, that's another irony. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'll watch the video and find out what your take is um, <laughs> on, the, on the irony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's interesting. Like the way, the way I saw it is uh, as well is, and maybe you can comment on that, mm. is the, the irony of uh, a black uh, a black man working within a a white supremacist structure, mm -hmm. a, a black man reinforcing that structure, and and you know through through force, mm -hmm. and there, there there's an irony. Well, I feel like there there might be an irony there. I don't know if you can if you can comment on that the the, the, the idea that of of um, of a black person uh, reinforcing white supremacy in a way. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean, I think I feel like that definitely pieces of the sort of ironies that I was talking about definitely connect to that, but that's kind of another maybe frame or another kind of lens on it. And I think it's a, it's an important one. Um, I think, you know, for me, the idea there um, that would have been ironic to a lot of people is that the police are, have such a history of racism and racial oppression in the United States. So the government generally has a history of racism. The society has a history of racism. But at the end of the day, somebody, right, has to enforce that at a very, like, basic level, right? So you take land from people, right? You make them sharecroppers. And when they protest and they demand better wages or access to land, or they say my land was stolen, as Black citizens have done for hundreds of years, somebody has to come in with the baton and enforce the racist law, right? Same thing in more in, 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 in Jim Crow, in segregation. You know, my, my parents, my, you know, like I mentioned, my dad's Black, he marched for, uh, against segregation throughout the South. And there were times where he was arrested by the police and sometimes those officers were black, right? So here you have the most obvious example, right? Of a racist structure. You quite literally have the police enforcing a law that imposes segregation, that says that black people cannot eat at this restaurant. The police are the embodiment of a legal system that is unjust. And for a black person to take on that mantle, right? In some ways, I think you could call it ironic. But if I think you could flip it as well and say, it's not really ironic, it's the logical outcome. That is to say, it's the logical outcome if you're the kind of person like me who believes that systems and structures and institutions are ultimately more powerful than individuals. That doesn't mean that individuals don't matter. It does not mean that individuals don't have agency. We do. But it does mean that those systems and structures and logics are on aggregate going to be more powerful. And so then what that would say is it, in a way it's not it's not ironic, but rather it's to be expected that a black person would eventually take up this role in an American in American society. Absolutely, and I, and uh, you talked about protests and all that. I think I think one of the very overtly political like um, function of the, the police is in, in in the responses to protests and. Yeah. Um, uh, in um, I during BLM, 
Uh, mm. I, I went to 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 a march in in Montreal, mm. not not as big as the marches in, in in America, obviously. But the uh, one thing that 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 um that I noticed a lot is the the police force of of Montreal used a lot of black officers mm. uh, on the front lines of mm. uh, as as a way I, I imagine to justify or or you know um anyway I, I was wondering. In in those cases, because uh, we can segue that in, also into your your father's activism and and the picture that I would I, I'd love for you to comment, even mm-hmm. though you just did a bit, but um, the idea of uh, especially like in terms of of um, like civil rights protests mm-hmm. uh, using using uh, black officers uh, in in those cases has has is there a history of that? Is has it been done often to use? Um, to maybe quell the, 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 the criticism of the police in a way through that? Yeah. You know, it's a great question. I don't have, I'm not familiar with any research that's actually tried to document, right. Is that a ta- you know, how common of a tactic is that? Um, it certainly is a tactic and I can imagine a, you know, you can imagine a conversation, right. That's leading up to protests that the police know are coming that could take a couple of different forms and kind of end up with the same outcome, right? So like imagine one scenario where you have a black police chief or an advisor to the, you know, a black advisor who says to the chief, listen, you know, we have enough black officers to, to, you know, to, to, to work this protest. And I really think that if we have black officers, first of all, they might be a little bit less quick to react um, with violence. You know, we'll have a conversation with them before. We'll remind them that they have family members that are protesting because, right, every black it's it's just like a black like progressive or black liberal that has like a black conservative in their family. Like all these black officers have black people that are always challenging them at like family dinner and like the holidays, right? They, so they might say, listen, that could be your, some of your family members out there. So like, let's just understand what we're doing when we, so I could imagine the most enlightened kind of police leader ending up with the image that you saw in Montreal. I'm not saying that was what was behind it. I'm just saying I could imagine it. And then, of course, I can imagine, I think, the scenario that I think you were describing a little bit more, which is like um, the person who doesn't, you know, give a crap about the protesters, but knows that there's going to be news media and wants to have a picture in the newspaper that if they're going to have, you know, protesters standing up, banging against the cops, that, that they want them to be black cops so that at least the person who's unfamiliar with all of this, maybe is outside even the, you know, the city areas are not paying that much attention, who first hears about the protest when they read the newspaper article is like, uh, huh, I don't know. That's, I don't know what was going on there, but it doesn't look like it was racism because look at all those black cops. So I guess all I want to say is I could see different kind of motivations that would lead to the same like scenario. Um, and I don't, so I don't know what was happening in the particular instance, but given what I know about police culture, there's probably more people out there (laughs) who were making the decision based on the way you described it than there are in my, like, uh, you know, more kind of racially progressive, enlightened, uh, (laughs) way of reaching the same outcome. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and talking about that, like, um, can you talk about the, uh, well, I don't know if, if you want to talk about the picture because I, I think it's such a strong picture. Um, and then we can we can move on to more your book. And um, I, I wanted to add a little thought about your father and and and, and you. Uh, so, but do do you want to first comment on that on that picture yeah. first? Just so I can I, I probably will put the picture with your with your sure your strong. No, you know when I when I was thinking about the book and even thinking more recently about, you know, what happened in Memphis with the officers and, and Mr. Nichols and people say, you know, people are surprised that there's these black officers. I really often think of a picture that we have up in my house of my father being arrested. So he's, 
1964. Jim Crow is still the law throughout um, much of the Southern United States. Uh, he's in Atlanta. He's the executive secretary of an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was one of the big civil rights organizations in the U.S. in the 60s. And it was the one, as the, stu as the name suggests, that was led by students and had sort of a lot of young people, a lot of energy. In some ways, you could sort of the most one of the more more radical or more confrontational um, of the of the civil rights groups, and their headquarters was was Atlanta, which had somewhat less intense kind of overt you know, uh, segregation and racism as some other parts of the South, but still had plenty of it and still had, you know, segregated eating areas and segregated restrooms and, um, and segregated bathrooms and the like. Um, and so he was protesting, uh, segregation and he's being arrested, as you can see in the image by a group of officers, including, you know, a bunch of black cops. And when I think about that picture, I often think about another picture, which is from about 15 years earlier. And it's when the first eight officers are black officers are sworn into the Atlanta police force. So the original movement to hire a black officer was successful, right? You can see it from the time from my dad's arrest, um, because by then they have enough officers to arrest him. But in 19, but but that first group of eight, um, there was it was a citywide celebration. You know, the mayor came and said to them, "Do for policing what Jackie did for baseball," referring to Jackie Robinson. Um, and so it's like you have these moments. You have Martin Luther King marching for one black officer, then you have eight black officers and a citywide celebration. And then you have, I'm not the culmination, but another step. And my dad is protesting segregation and these officers are arresting them. And I often think how much I would love to interview those officers and find out like, you know, again, this goes to your, the conversation about Basquiat and, and Memphis, but like, what were they thinking? Like, cause I don't believe that those officers thought that segregation was good policy. Um, I'm not saying that there were no black people that ever thought that there were some, but I don't think by 1964 that they thought that. So they clearly were participating in some level in an enforcement of a legal regime and a legal structure that they thought was not just wrong, but probably immoral. Um, and why they were doing it, what they were thinking, what demands were being placed on them, whether they were sent to the scene for the same reasons that the Montreal that you you know you're hypothesizing that Montreal sent its black officers to the BLM protests, um, we won't ever know. But I, I, I find that I find the picture always kind of haunting in a way, and then especially so as we think about you know what happened in in, in Memphis with Mr. Nichols. Absolutely. And the, uh, and I want to talk about, uh, we can talk more about your book. Oh, and, and, and pause just here. for one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for, did I send you the Atlanta eight, the original eight block the, yeah, the, yeah, the, you that I just mentioned? Yeah, you did. I did. No, okay. I wasn't and, sure. And also I wasn't added, sure because uh, like a couple of people asked me for it. Uh, you know, different reporters have asked me for that over the last week. So I wasn't sure if I'd sent it to you. Oh, and and unlike different reporters, I, I'm very young. I, I read your 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 book on my iPad, so I, I have the pictures on my. IPad. Oh, <laughs> you're like right. I don't. I, right, right. You're like I don't need your. I don't need your email. I already have it. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 don't worry. Well, uh, like I was just trans transitioning in like more the like the second part of the interview where I was want to want to talk more about you, mm. your book, and maybe your future projects if you're allowed to talk about them but uh one thing i um i was uh <laughs> i was thinking about before going to this interview i was like do i want to talk to him about his dad because every interview that you've been in from uh, democracy now and uh jesse Lee peterson's interview god bless his soul uh <laughs> is is they always talk about you in relation to your dad mm. and i'm like it must at first all right at first let me premise this at first i thought that 
it would be annoying for you in the sense that you're living in the shadow of your dad or you're following his footsteps. Mm. But after reading your book and after, you know, after, after understanding more of who you are and all that, I'm understanding that you're not following his footsteps, but you're continuing them. You're, you're, you're not you're, like it's to understand you. You have to also understand the struggles of your dad, not because you're living in his shadow, but because you're continuing them. You're continuing the, the, the fight that he led. Right. So yeah. uh, if you want to talk about your dad and like how, how it relates to your own, you know, um, path, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, yeah, so I, I appreciate that. And I don't feel in any way, um, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. And in fact, as you can even see from this conversation, it's something that I will naturally bring up. Right. So it's not, it's not a thing that I'm, it's, it's a thing that I, I, I embrace. Um, and it's my mom and my dad. Um, my, you know, my dad was in the leadership and my mom was in the fellowship. So my dad is more kind of known, um, particularly to people kind of of that generation and, 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 and to history to an extent. Um, but it was really both my parents, uh, and the choices that they made when they were so young, you know, I think about my mom dropped out of college to join the civil rights movement. So she's a white woman who you could say at some level is not, you know, directly affected, right? But I mean, we're all affected, but she's affected in a different kind of way um, by Jim Crow than um, than a black person was. You know, my dad grew up between Chicago and Mississippi. So as a child, especially, I mean, both places, but especially in Mississippi, you know, he just faced straight up in your face, um, you know, uh, racism. And my mom, easily as a white person in the early 1960s, re- she could have really lived a li- chosen to live a life, right? She had the, she had the power to choose to live a life where she thought very little about race and where she thought very little about injustice. Um, my dad didn't really have that choice, but she did. And she, even with that option, chose to spend her, to chose to quit college, move to the South, join the civil rights movement and really devote her life. And she's, my dad has passed away. My mom's 81. She's still a passionate advocate for single payer health care, for the rights of Palestinian people. I mean, she's, has not stopped. Uh, she was at the, B, you know, BLM uh, marches in, uh, in, in, in New York. In fact, I sometimes feel like I need to keep up with my mom. I need to keep up with my mom. So I guess, I mean, I guess I would just say this about having been the child of civil rights workers um, is that, you know, in some ways I, this will sound weird or I don't want this to be like sort of like falsely self-deprecating, but I, I really mean it in that I often give credit to people who really like made a choice to do something radically different from their parents because in a way there's like an end there's like you know that's independence of thought i guess what i'm trying to say is of course i think of myself as an independent thinker and i have chosen you know i'm a law professor they weren't lawyers so i've chosen a different path in a lot of ways but i do think in some ways my commitment to social change my commitment to local action in particular as a way of fighting for social change. I work very much, you know, embedded in the New Haven community, New Haven, Connecticut, where I live now. Um, my my commitment to, um, to justice-related issues, I do feel like in a lot of ways that was kind of bred into me. It was almost would have had to been an act of resistance to, to choose some entirely other path. Um, but no, I love, I love, honestly, I love so much. I draw so much strength reading my my dad's story and my mom's story. And because I, I feel like even when I'm like low and frustrated and God knows there's so many times where we can feel low and frustrated given the state of the world and the state of our politics. But I feel like, okay, I came from these people who fought um when things were much worse than they are now 
And, and that gives me just a kind of a strength to go on and an inspiration to just keep on. Absolutely. And it, and it, it, and if you want to talk about what is keeping on for, for you, right. For James Foreman Jr. What is keeping on? What, what is, what is it that you do? What is it that you, because we haven't even talked about your, <laughs> your practice. We went right into the subject. We didn't talk about what you do. Yeah. So I'm a law professor. Uh, I teach it at Yale law school. Um, and I would say the, probably the big project that I'm working on now that, is keeping on for me is I'm the faculty director of a program called the Yale Law and Racial Justice Center, which started just a year ago. Um, and we have a fabulous executive director, a woman named Kayla Vincent. And so since we're only a year old, we only have kind of two projects that are we've launched so far. Um, but uh, the the thing to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them, but the the thing to say about them is that they're both very locally focused. I you know I mentioned in 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 just a minute ago um, that a lot of my work is of that nature. SNCC, the student, the, the the my parents' organization, one of their theories of change, which I have very much kind of bought into over the years, is that a lot to 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 really be lasting, a lot of the change and transformation has to take place at a local level. Um, and so the two projects we do um, are one, we run a program called the Law Access um, Program. And what that program is, is we recruit from the New Haven community, first generation, low income, underrepresented racial groups, formerly incarcerated, those are kind of our target area groups, but any of the above or anything kind of adjacent to any of those things who want to become lawyers. So it's a two-year program where we help you with every aspect of your law school application. And it grew out of, I, I, used, to, I, I used to teach in prisons that shut down with COVID, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to start it up again. But I used to teach a class in prison on the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system. And my incarcerated students would say to me, I'd like to be a lawyer one day. Is that possible? And I would give them the answer, yes, it is. Under the law, it is possible. There's a there's some extra barriers, but they can be overcome. But what I realized was, you know, it's one thing to give people that technical answer, but it's another thing to take somebody who is as far behind in some ways and has had few access to resources as my incarcerated students have been. So while they have incredible potential, they don't have a pathway to you know, studying for the LSAT, to writing your application, to applying, all of the, the nuts and bolts. Like it's a big deal to apply to law school. So we said, well, what if we focus on a particular community, New Haven, which is a wonderful city, but it's a very segregated city. It's a city that has a high rate, high rates of poverty. And but we know there's talent there. And what if we focus on this community and we say, we're going to try to recruit that talent and help all those people that want to become lawyers do that. So now we're three years in, and we have eight people that are in their first year of law school. Six are at University of Connecticut, one's at Yale, one's at Villanova. We have 14 people who are applying right now, and we have another 18 behind them that are in the first year of the process. And my dream is that over the next decade, we will be a form of both individual economic mobility, right, for all of these people who come from a wide range of backgrounds. And our fellows are all ages. Some of them are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. We have, in fact, we have a former police officer right now. In fact, we have a current police officer who's applying to law school right now in this, in this group of people. We have people that have been incarcerated. We have people that have from really all kind of pockets of the city. And through their access to illegal uh, law degree, they're going to be able to elevate themselves and their family's economic situation. But then this is the crucial part to me. They're also going to be a community of interest, right? And that over time, there'll be a collective power because a lot of them want to be social change lawyers. They want to be public interest lawyers. They want to work on housing inequality. They work on work, work on educational inequality. They want to be public defenders. So I'm imagining that over time, we're going to build this cohort of, you know, 
folks of color, first generation, basically people that have been locked out and locked down that now are being elevated. And I think they're going to transform the city. I think we'll, you know, we'll have this conversation 10 years from now and I'll be able to tell you about um, all of the ways in which our, our community has changed and access to the courts has changed because um, of, of, of this cohort. Um, I, I love that so much. It's, it's super inspiring. I, I really like the idea um, because, you know, earlier we were talking about a system, like, uh, like, like the systems versus the individual and sense that like the systems need to change, not the individuals. And um, you're taking individuals, but you know, and but putting them together in a sense that like you know and and building that that power and as you were talking i was like i was thinking like well isn't that the same as saying as thinking well you know if you take uh black cops from like impoverished and you make or black people from impoverished and make them cops is that going to change and it's it's it didn't change much right but at the same time th these people have well, with a law degree, and you you know it very well. I don't have a law degree, but with a law degree, you have power, right? You right. You, you do have power to to change, and I imagine through your work in the past, because you were a public defendant and all that, you've seen that power in action, right? Changing changing the lives of people, and I, I think there's a difference between, uh, like at first at first I was thinking like, what's the difference between that and and, and uh, you know black cops? And we just talked about that not changing right. anything, right? But uh, there is the difference, I think. No, but I really love your question because so I teach the class. I teach a class on the topic of this program to a group of law students. So current law students at Yale. And then those law students help run the program. Right. So it's kind of like I teach 15 or 16 law students and then the law students go out and work as coaches. Uh, they go out into the community, basically, and connect with all of the, the fellows they're the ones that are teaching them the LSAT. They're the ones that are giving them the application advice. So it's kind of a multi-step process. But in the seminar with my law students, we talk about this question all the time. Really? Right? Oh, cool. oh yeah, yeah. Because it's a really, it's a really important question, right? It's to what extent are we just replicating like structures and hierarchies of inequality versus challenging them? Right. And so the, I, the tension is real. And I could imagine, you know, we'll have to see five years out, 10 years out, there could be a point where we would do, you know, some kind of analysis, somebody would write a paper, I hope this isn't the outcome, but where they, <laughs> where they say, no, exactly as, 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 as you sort of your first thought was, um, maybe, and maybe they're just putting a different group of people into the same sort of unjust system. We think that this, the the second answer that you gave to yourself, you know, is in a sense is our answer that both for two reasons. One, because at, with that law degree, you do have a lot more power and influence to, to change policy, right? You can not just go to the state legislature, but you could become a state legislator and advocate for policies that Require, require employers to um, give a real chance to people who are coming out of prison when they're looking for jobs. And you can do that advocacy because you yourself were incarcerated. You yourself knew how hard it was to get employed. You faced the obstacles. Now you've gone into power and you're in the state legislature telling your colleagues, right, or arguing as a lobbyist or uh, to the state legislator, legislature, you're sharing your experience to be able to change laws and policies. So it's because we think we're putting people in a position of power, number one. And number two, it's because we're trying to move people in community with one another. We're not sending like a sing. It's not like we just put a single person out there and then hope, but we have a network, right? Our fellows are a network. They come together and they meet with us regularly, they are going, some of them are to going to go into jobs in, you know, progressive minded law firms or legal aid offices, and they're going to go there not by themselves, but they're going to go there with somebody else who's part of their same cohort. So we think that there's a, a power in numbers and a, a power in community um, that, and, and that, that will 
make it a different experience um, than than what we see with police. But it, it is a profound question and 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 time will ultimately tell. Yeah. And also the power that you give to cops is 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 tied to to like the function of the state as a, as the That's power right. that you give to a lawyer is a bit more independent. That's right. And and so it's less tied to the functions of, you know, oppressive systems and all that. But it's just it's just something that came up because I was like <laughs> It, cause it is it is like because we just talked about it but no no i i i, I don't want to undermine your project because i think it's an amazing project i think it's 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 really cool and i love the the community aspect of it because uh even art personally I, I keep telling people stop asking me which artist is to look out for right look for artists in your community these mm -hmm. are people who are going to talk to you who are going to speak to you yeah you, know, you, you have access to the most artists just online ever possible in the history of the world so why don't you just look out for yourself? You know, you have people would dream of that, right? So no, look out in your community, look out in in groups of affinities for something yeah. like that. And that's can I mention? Can I mention our one other project? Just absolutely. Is it, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the other big project that we have is called New Haven Neighbors for Justice, and so the idea behind this comes from the following, and I think this could really apply for a lot of your viewers and a lot of your listeners, no matter where they live. So we ask people in around New Haven, how many of your neighbors are locked up? How many of your neighbors are incarcerated? And on Yale's campus, in um, the wealthier neighborhoods of New Haven, people look at you like you're great. Like they don't even understand yeah. the question. Um, in some of the more working class um, neighborhoods, like where our racial justice center is located, people get the question. But they start to think about like a friend or a, a, or a family member, maybe. But nobody ever yet has given us the answer. Oh, I have 600 incarcerated neighbors at the local jail. Despite the fact that every single one, wherever you are, whether, wherever you live in the, our little small city, you are at most two miles away from the jail. And, and many people, including Yale students, are like half a mile. And so we want to say to people, wait, but you have 600 incarcerated neighbors. And when we say that, and they're like, what? And then we start talking about the local jail. And we want to use that provocation to generate a series of conversations around the city that are organized around the idea of what would it look like for us to think of those men who are incarcerated, and this facility happens to be an all-male facility, as our neighbors. If we thought of them as our neighbors, what obligations of neighborliness, of compassion, of care, of consideration would grow out of that relationship? And we are bringing people in conversation across the city, uh, across communities in conversation to ask that question and we're getting all kinds of amazing answers, right? People talk about um, hiring people that have come out of prison. People talk about reading groups and libraries inside of the jail. People talk about support for the family members of those who are incarcerated. Like when you bring people together and you start to have this conversation, it gets very gener gener generative. People have ideas about what they can do. And so what we do in the Racial Justice C Center is we're like the infrastructure to make those, to turn those conversations, to make sure that those conversations don't just become like, well, we got together and we had a conversation and we all went home, but like it turns into a project, right? Because everybody, people can come for a conversation, they can come for a series of conversations, but everybody has a full-time job. They're doing something else. You need to have an institution that is going to provide the backbone, the staffing, the resources to be able to push that, that group of neighbors in forward in their action. So we just started um, and we got our inspiration actually from a group in DC that's called Neighbors for Justice um, that a friend of mine helped to start. Uh, but we're really excited about about this because to me, the, the the fundamental thing that this can do that I think a lot of people crave, so many people, at least in my world, have come to learn that there's an unfairness in our criminal system. But they don't know what to do about it. They don't know how they can help make a difference. And what this is, is a vehicle for, 
a vehicle for people to be able to come together in community, decide on something that feels good to them, where they really feel like they can make a contribution, and then do it. That's 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 amazing, it's especially inmates. Um, we well, they are literally hidden away, right? That's so right. We don't even con- like conceive of them as either neighbors. We don't even consider them as you know as individuals. They're just yep. the, the the a group of people that are locked up, hidden away, and it's 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 hard. Well, not it's hard, but it's it's um it's easy to 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 not see them as individuals with families with you know who live in the community as well right these people's right. families are are around us um and yeah creating a support group for that is absolutely amazing i'm i'm so happy that you, you know that you have those projects and uh, it's 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 great to it's great to hear it's super inspiring as well if people want to you know find their local are, are there any because you said there was in dc and in connecticut are, are there any other um like projects like that around around the country not no i don't think so um so we're one of the things that we plan on doing is we plan on doing a mapping project that we will eventually like unveil on our website to try to show people how many places how many cities in particular had the opportunity to do this so at least in the u.s most jails are located right in the middle of urban centers right and most prisons are located far you know hundreds of miles often many many hundreds of miles away in more kind of rural uh communities more distant from the city centers so um and, and jails are typically where somebody is held from the time they're arrested before they go to trial or if they have a very short sentence so they tend to be places with a kind of a higher amount of turnover like you might be in jail for three days you might be in jail for a week you might be in jail for a month as opposed to prison where maybe you're going to be there for five years you're going to be there for 10 years so the the needs of people in a jail and people in our prison are different um but all of them need to be understood and thought of as you know as as neighbors so what we plan on doing to answer your question is we want to do a mapping project where we show people where all of these facilities are and then we show people the resources right in many cases universities where we think there'll be a lot of appetite we don't think we're the only university that would be motivated to do a project like this so we think you have prisons and jails you have universities and then you have other resources and we want to we want to put that picture in front of people visually so that plus tell them the story of what we're doing as a template, not as like a mandate, but like here's some suggestions for some of the kinds of programs that could grow out of your Neighbors for Justice. And here are some of the pathways to get there, right? Here are the things that we did to go from, okay, we have this idea to now, here are a series of of, of programs. So, the DC organization, again, which is our initial inspiration, is focused on Washington, DC. We're focused on New Haven, but because we have more resources that we can bring to this, we hope to be able to begin to generate something that anybody in the anybody in the country or and having this conversation with a with a Canadian is making me think that it's yeah. gotta be, you know, anybody in North America sure. um, would be able to see um see the opportunities to do something similar so i would say not yet but um but keep an eye on our website yes yeah, well uh, i was gonna say uh if you want to um, maybe through email or something send the links to all of your all of your projects and uh i don't know which which place would be better if people want to uh, get your book like the, those links so i can put it in the like in the description okay if you have a website or something so people if they want to look up whatever project you have or i don't know if yeah. you, do you have a website or yeah i have you know it's funny when my i have a so i have a university website right i have yeah. like my faculty page on um that and when my in a few years two or three years after my book came out i had a a personal website that i was really sort of staying on top of because whenever i would have a a speaking engagement or thing like that, I would kind of, I would post it there. Um, 
but in you know that as the you know pandemic and my travel and talks kind of died down i stopped um i guess i you know keeping it as up to date um as i once did but yeah i can absolutely put my my own website i can put the website for the racial justice center i can put our email contact information um uh you know i can put a link to um you know i'm a big fan of of buying books from you know your local independent bookseller if one is available to you um but i can certainly put a link to um uh uh, you know, a place that people can buy it if they're not, if they don't have immediate access to, uh, to their local bookseller. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. And, uh, and I don't know if, how much you can talk about it cause it's not, it's not uh, like concrete or anything, but you talk to me about a, a new book. Yeah. I'm working on book book proposal right now. I, you know, my guess is it's always so hard to predict with books, but um, my guess is, you know, uh, it may be a year to year and a half to actual like public, you know, seeing it on, on, on the shelf. Um, and even that might be like an author's optimism, but, uh, uh, what I can say about it is that it is really focused on the question that we just were talking about, which is I'm somebody that thinks this system is unfair, but I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how I can participate in the change process. Um, so you could think of in a way like my, like locking up our own. And then some of those other books that I mentioned by Coates and Stevenson and Alexander and others, those books are really about like defining the problem, right? Helping persuade people that this is a crisis and, and giving them some of the historical nuance to understand how it came to be. And my next project is about, all right, what do we do about it? Yeah. And, and very specifically, how can individual people participate in that process? So, um, yeah. Yeah. The, the anxieties of that question hit me all the time. You know, I, I, I feel myself, I, I am, I'm very privileged. I also have a, like a pretty strong platform online and I feel like, despite that 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 influence right i i feel like i i'm powerless and i'm like i i can't imagine someone you know like who doesn't have the the small bit of influence that i have the small bit of power you know that yeah. i have i i i can't even i feel like i'm not doing anything and like someone who doesn't even have that 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 there's different ways of, of course to like you know to influence and 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 have power but like sometimes it feels a bit overwhelming and especially in the age of uh of like you know social media and everything where everything is going so fast and and yeah. you you notice more your your irrelevancy <laughs> no in a way i don't know i don't know if you well no you're a pulitzer prize winning book writer right so you know <laughs> no i know exactly no i know exactly yeah. what you mean of course yeah, of course exactly. everybody's always in some way, shape, or form. I mean, anybody that has a public posture, it's not your only consideration and, and it may not be your main consideration. It really depends on, you know, on who you are and your personality. And and I'm fortunate in that I have a, you know, I have a full-time job that is not tied to my public persona. Um, so um, I'm not dependent on being relevant in that way. But of course, if you're passionate about your views, you want <laughs> you want to put them out there. Yeah. Um, so, um, but uh, I don't know what painting we will link it to. That will be <laughs> exactly. my job. But I would be happy um, to come back and have this conversation with you about what can people do um, uh, when 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 my next book is out. I'd love that. I'd love. I. I, I... I've developed a talent to find whatever <laughs> painting is possible <laughs> to shoehorn a conversation, whatever I want. I've I, I, like, I, I consider myself an anarchist, right? And I, and I don't know how many times I've mentioned anarchism through whatever paintings, <laughs> whatever means necessary. Mm. And yeah. And I feel like, like, um, I feel like speaking of that, like a lot of, a lot of younger people in, the, in my generation are, are more and more, uh, I would say radicalized in a mm. way. Um, 
And I feel like that contrib- that contributes to our the idea that we can't do anything about it. You know, when 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 you when when your end goal is so is so like if if my end goal was you know to um, I don't know uh, for gun reform, yeah, that's feasible. Yeah, but if my end goal is to destroy capitalism and the state that that enables it, then then immediately you you know you lose all hope. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear that for sure. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I have run cause I actually have an appointment with my yeah, son's school at, uh, yeah, in a few ahead. minutes, but I will just say this. The book would definitely be me, be more helpful for somebody who defines their end goal as gun reform <laughs> <laughs> than it does. Than, but you probably knew that already from yeah, talking yeah, no, to me. Um, <laughs> so I just want to like, you know, level set. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 of course, of course. But I'm, I'm sure there will be relevant answers as well, you know, and yeah. uh, to um, the people who want to destroy capitalism, maybe start with gun reform or something like that, you know, <laughs> and it'll be a more feasible and more, uh, I don't know, less uh, less uh, pessimistic uh, outcome. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you. And I, and I you've given me so much material. I like part of me just wants to put everything in that, in that video. <laughs> So uh, well, it'll be hard that, to... that, that, that choice will be up to you, but uh, I, I do appreciate the chance to have this conversation. I appreciate you reaching out and I will, uh, I will keep learning about politics through art uh, with you in the, in the years to come. <laughs> that's so, that's so, that's so nice. Thank you. And I'll send you a link for this, for the video. Uh, All right. Done. Sounds Thank good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take good have care. A nice day.